Welcome back, Letterman Row listeners, watchers, YouTube subscribers, readers of the website. Uh, thanks for joining another episode of Talking Stuff, the Ohio State Recruiting Podcast, brought to you by our good friends at Buyers Automotive. My name is Jeremy Birmingham. On the phone with me, as usual, Spencer Holbrook. Um, Spencer, it's uh, it's been a few days since we've talked about stuff about Ohio State recruiting, and not a lot's really happening when it comes to the Buckeyes part of, of things, especially in 2021. The Buckeyes have been on the road. Uh, the coaching staff has been on the road all, all last week and will continue to do that uh, this upcoming weekend. But w- the, the real story in recruiting this weekend are the major recruiting uh, on-campus weekends that happened at places like Michigan and Clemson. Um, Michigan using this weekend as an opportunity to get all the in-state kids that they're targeting in, in Michigan uh, to visit, and that includes guys like Donovan Edwards and Rocco Spindler and Garrett Dellinger, et cetera, and so forth. But nationally, the story is Clemson, who had their big junior day weekend, um, which the the results from that are still coming in it, and Overall, it couldn't have gone better at this point. They've landed three commitments already. One from former five-star wide receiver Bo Collins, the number two ranked receiver in the country, a player we've talked about a lot at Ohio State. We visited him in California for Bermanology in October. Uh, Jake Brininstool, the second ranked tight end in the country, and then Kay Denoff, a top 50 overall player and defensive end from Florida who Ohio State has offered. And uh, it, it just... Things are not going to slow down at Clemson, and I think people are are starting to wonder, like, is that is that a program right now that uh, is just able to do whatever they want? And it sort of seems like that, right? It's the 2011 version of Alabama, but just in the current form, you know? That's, that's what it seems like. In, in 2011 and 2012, Alabama walked into any community, any program they wanted and said, we're winning a national championship this year. You can either become aboard – where you can be left behind because we're going to beat you on the field if you don't come with us. Clemson is doing the exact same thing in the ACC. They're going anywhere they want in the country to get whoever they want. Um, and you know, we were talking before the show a little bit. They have no competition in the ACC. So if you want to win a national championship, you have to get to the Final Four first, right? And to get to the college football playoff, it's easiest in the ACC. Clemson can just guarantee these kids a trip to the playoff. And that's just like a selling point. Like Ohio State can obviously do the same right now because they just made it to the play to the playoff. But like Clemson's been there so many straight times, they just get to sell this idea of we have been dominant, we're going to stay dominant. Nobody's catching us. You might as well come aboard. And yeah, it's really fascinating. That that gap between Clemson and the rest of the ACC is so huge. And we talk uh, obviously we cover Ohio State and, and deal with the Buckeyes on a daily basis and. The gap between Ohio State and the rest of the Big Ten is pretty large, but the fact is the Big Ten champion three of the last four years in the in a college football playoff was left out, right? Clemson hasn't lost any games uh, in the regular season, seems like, in 10 years, and I, I just don't see it happening anytime soon. Their schedule in 2021 is even worse than the schedule in 2020, or, or the 2020 schedule is even worse than 2019 somehow. Um, they, they have been put in this position um, where they've basically been given carte blanche to create a, a full-fledged, unstoppable dynasty. And on the recruiting trail right now, if kids visit there, they're pretty much going to commit there. And, that, and it's it's a, it's an interesting dynamic because you see what they do. And, you know, these big recruiting weekends, like these junior weekends, that Ryan Day has said, I'm not going to do those things. And, and it's simply because Ohio State doesn't think that Kids want to come to Columbus in the middle of January from all over the country. If you have a kid down in Georgia on a weekend like this one, like let's say Jordan Hancock and Barrett Carter, the the, the two four stars at uh, 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 Sewanee, Georgia's North Gwinnett High School, if those guys would have had the opportunity this weekend to fly to Ohio State or make a couple hour drive to Clemson, what are you going to do? And I think the Buckeyes have just realized that these winter weekends with the weather being what they are, you just don't know what you're going to get. And it doesn't make sense. But you know, if the Buckeyes were in South Carolina or Georgia or somewhere like that, I think they would obviously use them because these weekends are turning into major recruiting tools for these kids who get a chance to sit and hang out with all of the top players in the country. And these, this is when bonds get made. So it's a very interesting uh, approach for Ohio State to basically say, we can't win this battle right now. We have to win it in the long term with relationships. And that's also another reason why in the spring last year, you saw, we were at that spring practice. It was actually my first practice I'd ever been to. 
for an Ohio State practice, and there were 20 co- recruits there. Some commit, some uncommitted, but they if they're going to do something like that, they wait until the spring, right? They're not going to risk bringing kids in in the winter just because the weather, like you said, the weather changes so much. I mean, uh, you know, there's snow on the ground in parts of Ohio right now, and that's just not the case in South Carolina. So, I mean, you can't really move where you're at geographically. It, it is what it is. Yeah, the interesting thing is, and what what Clemson does really well, um, just from talking to people in the recruiting world, they don't do a lot of their own sort of scouting and homework. It's almost like they let other schools do the homework for them and then go out and just recruit the best players. And uh, so far that's working because these kids who once they commit to Clemson are not decommitting. And that's that's the thing. You look at Brian Brzee last year. Um, you, know, you look at Trevor Lawrence. You look at all these guys. They they commit early and they stay committed. And, and what Dabo Sweeney has built there is really incredible. Um, and it's it, it's no sign of slowing down. And I think that for Ohio State fans and, and Big Ten fans in general, like it's a pretty scary thing because Clemson, that, that is only on the way up right now. Yeah, there's no slowing down with them. That's just how it is. Dabo is building uh, something that I believe is actually passing what Alabama has had for the last decade. Um, as, as dominant as Alabama had, they still you know, would lose an occasional game to Ole Miss. They would lose an occasional game to, uh, yeah. to LSU now. That's just not happening at Clemson because there's not good teams in the ACC. That's just the way it is. And when you can tell kids, we're going 12-0 and every year, like I said, get on board or be left behind because we're going to beat you if you don't join us. It's a really easy way to recruit. And, you know, you can only take 25 guys in the class, and that's supposed to level the playing field a little bit. You know, you take 25 to 26, 27. But when every single guy you're getting is a five-star or a high-priority four-star, it's pretty impressive what Clemson's doing. Like even the Ohio States and the Alabamas of the world are taking three star kids that are projects. Clemson is just, it seems like Clemson doesn't do that very often because they don't have to. Well, they have it in the last few years and that, it's, it's, it's just wild to see where this can go. I mean, as a fan of college football, I think it's just interesting to watch. You're talking about a program that barring something catastrophic happening, uh, as young as Dabo Swinney is, like this could be another 10 years of this. I mean, it, it is going to be a run that I don't think college football has ever seen before. And um, it just puts the onus on Ohio State to make sure that the guys that they get are the right fits uh, and, and and that it's the players that really can compete um, on a social and, and football level with, with Clemson. You know, I, I know Bo Collins, as we said, we've talked about him a lot. Ohio State was not in a position right now where where Collins was a major priority because of Jaden Ballard's commitment, because of Marvin Harrison Jr.'s commitment. But the fact is, it's it's still a head-to-head battle with Clemson, who has a first-year wide receivers coach after Jeff Scott left to take the head coaching job at South Florida. And that battle right now between Brian Hartline and, and the, the Clemson receivers coach um, – is going to be tested because Emeka Abuka is still out there, Troy Stilato is still out there. Those two schools are going to go head to head for those players, and I think right now Clemson may be in the lead for both of them. So um, it's just interesting to watch how th- those battles are going to come up because, as we've written about in the past, Ohio State right now isn't really recruiting against Michigan or Penn State or those types of schools very often. Right now, this is Ohio State, Clemson, Ohio State, Georgia, Ohio State, Alabama, and. Uh, the battles are going to be won differently, and that's it's it's going to be fascinating to see the different um, approach. But also, what kids as, as we advance as, as now twenty twenty, like what are the kids looking for? And I think that makes all the difference, right? Yeah, it does. You know, you just I, if a kid's looking for a certain thing, and Clemson has it, and Ohio State has it, and then Clemson can use its other recruiting tools it has at its disposal. It's, it's very, very difficult to, to make progress. I think I want to say one more thing on this topic. Ohio State cannot miss on recruits. Yeah. Alabama cannot miss right now on recruits because if you miss, you're falling behind. Yeah. And it's kind of the same thing with what Michigan does and what Wisconsin does with Ohio State. If you miss, when you get a high four-star over Ohio State, if you miss on him, it, it, it just grows the gap. It's just Recruiting is so... Um, I don't even I don't know the word. It's uh, it's very hit or miss, and if you miss, you're falling way behind. I mean, it's just, the the nature of this of this beast that that you have to cover every day, and that you know I I have the privilege of, of watching from a little bit of afar. You just you 
you can't miss because if you miss, you're getting lapped. You're not getting passed, you're getting lapped. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've talked about this for the last year plus. Right now, the gap between Ohio State, Clemson, Alabama, Georgia, uh, and everyone else is so wide. I mean, you see right now, you, I, I've told people in other avenues and other mediums, I really think Oregon's in a position where they can become sort of the Clemson of the West Coast uh, in the near future if, if Mario Cristobal continues to do to he, what he's done up there. But uh, the, the difference between Ohio State and Clemson right now is ultimately not much more than geography. And when kids want to go to a place like Clemson, uh, it is remote. It is in its own little world down there in South Carolina, as opposed to being in Columbus, which is obviously a big city, a place where people are are living a totally different way. Um, the focus is way different in Columbus. The attention from the media, Kevon Wallace, who's a, a safety at Clemson, told me uh, before the Fiesta Bowl, that he wanted to go somewhere where he knew that there wasn't the the possibility of getting in trouble because the city made him feel like that's what he would do. So um, I think it's just interesting to watch and, and to see the difference in the programs because they're so similar in so many ways, but their, their geography is so completely different that a lot of what kids decide is based almost on that. So um, I, think, I think one last thing we need to, to kind of touch on is Ohio State is not going anywhere either. Like this is not – we're not trying to rain on an Ohio State parade because Ohio State still has an incredible 2021 class. It's still ranked ahead look, of Clemson, so, I mean, that's something you when, have to remember. When you look south right now, though, at Clemson and what Clemson is doing, it is running circles around everyone in the south, including the SEC schools, and it's also going to California. And yeah. It's just – it's it, you know, as a, a fan of just the sport, this is just – it's fascinating to watch. Well, that's why I think it's crazy to me that, that USC, I mean, we can go on a tangent here, but USC's decision to retain Clay Helton knowing full well that their recruiting is dead until he either wins a Pac-12 title and can prove that he belongs there or they fire him and bring in someone like Urban Meyer. Like, they are letting this happen in their backyard. That I mean, you're talking about Corey Foreman, who I, the number one player in the country is now, as I said, leaning very heavily to Clemson and is expected to commit there sometime in the near future. Uh, Bo Collins just committed there. DJ Ungalale, uh, I don't know how to pronounce his name, doesn't matter. U- ukulele. He, you know, Ungala, Ungale, whatever it is, he's signed at Clemson and already there. Right now, that area, one of the most talented areas in the country, is just being picked apart as USC and UCLA continue to flounder, and, and the Trojans have decided that it's totally okay. I mean, they have like the 75th ranked 2020 recruiting class, and that is just embarrassing. Uh, and, and the fact that the administration decided to accept that, I mean, the fact is, you can lose games on the field a couple times a year. If you want to go 9-3, and 10-2, and two, that's not a bad season, right? But like, if you aren't getting these players in Los Angeles to go to USC, that is that is that is enough reason to move on from Clay Helton right now. And I I, I can't imagine what Mike Bone and the USC uh, athletic department is doing when you're letting this happen. And it's only going to get worse between Oregon and and their now avenue into California, uh, Clemson, what they're doing, Ohio State, Alabama has always done well out there. Uh, it, it's, LSU is. Is going in there right. and taking who they want. LSU throw. obviously getting Elias Ricks out of there last year. Rajon Davis, the number one ranked inside linebacker in the country in the class of 2021, just committed to LSU. He's from Matter Day High School. I mean, you're talking about the biggest of the big, and they're all leaving California. And I can't believe USC has allowed uh, Clay Helton to stay employed there because of those reasons. But anyway, let's move on. I, I could talk about the semantics of recruiting uh, and all day. Go ahead. One- one thing I wanted to add before we moved on to just actually zoning on Ohio State is like there will be people, I'm sure, in our comments of this podcast saying this is an Ohio State recruiting podcast. Why are you doing this? This all ties into Ohio State. Sure. I mean, it is absolutely relevant to Ohio State because if you want to follow what Ohio State is doing on the recruiting trail, and recruiting is comparative. You have to – and it's all relative. Like Ohio State could nab a four-star – linebacker and the number four linebacker in the country, but if Clemson has the number three and the number two, that's relative to what Ohio State's doing because they're not closing the gap. Like, Ohio State ties into all of this because as well as Ohio State's recruiting, Clemson's doing it, and USC's not doing it. So, okay, you don't have to worry about them right now. Right, but and, now you, and now you have LSU reemerging and Georgia. And, I mean, the, the 
the Buckeyes have the number one ranked recruiting class in the Big Ten by a large, very wide margin, right? And they're the fourth best team recruiting wise in the country right now. And I don't think they'll finish. Uh, they may finish number five uh, if LSU adds a few other pieces here before February 5th. So it's like, you know, if you're a fan of the Big Ten, if you're a fan of, of football anywhere other than the SEC, it's becoming harder and harder to keep up. And, uh, you know, the, the Buckeyes are going to do things the way they're going to do things. But as, when it comes to just sheer numbers, when it comes to geography, when it comes to demographics of people moving around the country, uh, it's becoming harder and harder for Ohio State to recruit the best of the best. And I think it's only uh, more reason to give kudos to what Urban Meyer did and what Ryan Day did. Uh, and for the Buckeyes to keep that going, they're going to have to win a national championship again soon and and get back to the college football playoff every single year like Alabama and Clemson have proven they, that they can do. Because otherwise, I mean, it, it's, not, it's not a doomsday scenario, but mediocrity happens pretty quick. Um, if an entire conference is basically ruled irrelevant uh, because Clemson and the SEC are winning every single championship. So anyway, let's move on. Let's talk about uh, 2020. Um, we, we've mentioned Cam Martinez a number of times in the last couple weeks. Uh, we are now, what, 10 days away from signing day, February 5th. Still no visit to Notre Dame. Uh, and I think if you're an Ohio State fan, knowing that this coming Sunday, next week, Super Bowl Sunday, that's the start of the recruiting quiet period. Uh, if Cam Martinez doesn't take a midweek visit to Notre Dame this week, I think that the crisis has been avoided because uh, he has a basketball game on Friday night. He has a basketball game on Saturday night. And then the recruiting quiet period starts on Sunday. So uh, there is really only a couple days here for that to to turn into code red for Ohio State, right? Yeah. Yeah, Ohio State. Has, I think Ohio State's done a pretty good job with this entire situation. I, I'm going to give kudos to what the Buckeyes are doing right now. Um, just kind of letting this play out, knowing what they had coming in Kerry Coles. And then when they announced that he went up there and visited the camp, and they've taken the slow approach, never given him an ultimatum from what we've heard from, from people inside the building. And I just think the way they've handled this entire situation has been uh, the right way to do it. And it's, it's gotta be a good sign for them. If, if Cam still hasn't gotten on, uh, gotten to South Bend because I, you know, make, I, if I'm not mistaken, South Bend's pretty, not terribly far from Muskegon. No nope. quick, quick little drive three and a half hours down uh, the West coast of Michigan. And the reality for, for Notre Dame here is it looks like, it, I'm going to backtrack. I, I, I was kind of curious a few weeks ago why Notre Dame decided to really get back into uh, the conversation here or try to get back into the conversation with Martinez because in the summertime they sort of like pushed him off to the side not thinking that he was uh, a player good enough for their defensive side of the ball. Uh, now they're saying, you know, maybe you can play offense, you can do this. They wanted them to come camp after they already offered and he was uh, just not into that idea because they had already offered. So, um it came out this weekend that one of the Notre Dame signees uh, has been told he cannot enroll at, Ohio, or at Notre Dame because of a legal issue. Uh, Landon Bartleson, a cornerback from Kentucky, who uh, I think is a really special athlete, a guy that Ohio State actually recruited pretty hard about a year ago when Jeff Halfley uh, started in Columbus, but they, they moved on from him uh, as they found their other corners. But uh, when Bartleson's situation, I think, must have been percolating behind the scenes here because th there was no other real explanation for why this Notre Dame push happened. Um, and now you start to see why. It's just, I just The machinations of recruiting are so awesome to watch because there's always a reason that things are happening. And people, um, I think, sometimes just assume it's it's random and willy-nilly, but like every single move is calculated. And Notre Dame, uh, having the... A knowledge of this situation with Bartleson, understanding that Ohio State had some o openings uh, in, with the Halfley issue and, and not sure who was going to be the defensive backs coach. Like Notre Dame probably saw an opportunity to sneak in there and, and steal Cam Martinez. And um, to, to Cam's credit, he's been as pragmatic as possible um, since the decision to not sign in December. And he's done that again. And, and to, to wait, to let himself get the opportunity to meet Kerry Combs, that's going to continue that Combs is supposed to go back to uh, Michigan this week, this coming week with Brian Hartline. Uh, to me, like I said, it's shaping up to a situation where if there's not a visit made to Notre Dame on Monday or Tuesday, that this is a, a done deal and that Cam will sign with the Buckeyes. Yeah. Great news for Ohio state, right? We've talked, we talked for 20 minutes about 
bad news for Ohio State in the form of Clemson, and Clemson just continues to be the pain of the Hey, I don't think that's bad news, though, Spencer. I think it's good news. I think it's great to know who you're really going against. Don't you? Yeah, because, yeah, the Buckeyes no, no longer need to, to compare themselves, and they will, to Michigan, because it's just they've passed Michigan. And so now you have to set your sights further, and you got to know what your competition is. You got to know know your audience. And your audience is kids trying to go to Clemson too. But back to Cam, you know this is great news for Ohio State. This is a kid, a high priority. And I've had some people come up to me. Why are, why are they so crazy about a three star kid? And we've talked ad nauseum. They want this guy. They do not view him as a three star. They view him as one of the best players in the country. Yeah, it's a huge win for Ohio State to keep him roped in with everything that happened with Jeff Hafley. Uh, when we went and talked with Cam in, in, back in July, it was a long time ago, but back in July, it feels like forever ago, he was super confident with Jeff Halfley, and Jeff Halfley had never even coached a game before at yeah. Ohio State. Yeah. And now for him to try and form a new relationship with a guy who has coached at Ohio State and has NFL experience, just like Jeff Halfley, but also has the Ohio State wrinkle, it's pretty impressive on Kerry Coombs' end to, to keep him roped into this class. Yeah, I mean, again, it's not a done deal. I, I'm just trying to read the tea leaves here, and to me – um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if things uh, get finalized here in the next couple of days because, again, the schedule, the timeline here is shrinking for Cam to make any visits to Notre Dame or Northwestern, which if he went to Northwestern, it'd have to be an unofficial visit um, because he's already taken an official there. Um, Notre Dame has been the team that there's been this bubbling confidence out of South Bend, and, and I don't know exactly what that's based on. I, I know that my relationship with Cam has been pretty good. Um, the the sense that I've gotten has been that Ohio State's where he wanted to be all along and I think he was just being smart to make sure that he knew exactly who his coach was going to be considering he's never played that position before. And um, Bottom line, I think if you don't see photos of Cam Martinez at Notre Dame in the next two days, uh, that it's probably a pretty good sign for Ohio State. One, one photo you're going to see, I'd assume, in the next uh, day or two is Kerry Combs. Uh, in St. Louis, Missouri, where Ja'Kalen Johnson, one of the country's top five ranked cornerbacks in the class of 2021 is. And he's a guy that a lot of people are curious about. Ohio State actually went and saw him on Friday with Brian Hartline and Matt Barnes. And now Combs is going back on Monday. Um, That's a pretty good indicator, Spencer, that the Buckeyes are extremely serious about a a player in that class. Yeah. Yeah, if you just look at Ja'Kalen Johnson's – Ja'Kalen, right? Yeah. I, mean, I want to make sure I get all these names right because you know them all. If this kid is as talented as they come in this class, Ohio State's going to go after him hard. Uh, I think this is going to be a high, high priority for the Buckeyes moving forward. This kid right here can defend. He's long. He's a Kerry Coombs corner, right? Mm-hmm. Six foot, 170 pounds. He is a Kerry Coombs corner, and that is the perfect build. Uh, and not to mention he's the number one player in Missouri and the number five cornerback in the country. Like, If the Buckeyes can, can go and, and grab this guy, maybe maybe they'll feel better about uh, what's going on at Clemson. You know? Yeah, I mean... Tie, tie it back in the beginning of the episode. Right, I mean, that's the thing. It's going to be a back and forth. I mean, those two teams right now are the number one and number two ranked teams in the country. I talked to Robert Steeples, who's a former NFL cornerback and the head coach at Dismount High School in St. Louis uh, last week, and uh, he said he was excited about meeting Kerry Combs, and there's an opportunity here for Ohio State to make a, a big move um, with Jaquelin Johnson. I wouldn't be surprised if you see something happen here in the next week or two from him. Uh, there's no nobody telling me that this commitment is coming, but it just seems like the decision to send three coaches to see him in, in a three-day stretch uh, is intentional to me, and I, I the first meeting with Kerry Combs is going to be a big one. Uh, so just watch for what happens there, I guess. Um, see if that unfolds as it uh, could. But you know, for Ohio State, that position, the defensive back spot in 2021, is going to be a major priority. And getting uh, the first cornerback in that group to join a player like Jalen Johnson, who's maybe more of a hybrid, uh, is very important to get that knocked out of the way early um, and to, again, bring in one of the Midwest's best and not let that player go to Notre Dame or, or get lured away by somewhere like Georgia. Uh, all these opportunities are going to uh, present themselves to Ja'Kalen Johnson. So that's where we're going to app, uh, app, wrap up this episode of Talking Stuff, uh, the Ohio State Recruiting Podcast, brought to you by Buyers Auto. I am Jeremy Birmingham for Ledman Road. That is Spencer Holbrook. Thank you for listening. Thanks for watching. And we will talk to you folks again in a few days. Thanks so much.
Thanks for watching. Subscribe below to get the latest videos from Letterman Row. We got Letterman Live, we've got the practice report, we got rapid reaction. Hey, and you know we got Buck IQ with Zach Bourne. For sure. We got recruiting breakdowns with Berm. We got whatever you need. Ohio State football and Ohio State Athletics, we've got you covered here at Letterman Row.